we look forward to a half a day of uh, discussion and listening to the word and uh, getting questions answered. I think we close by one o'clock. So let's make use of every minute of this time and not uh, waste our time. And I'm sure that we, since we started just a few minutes late, we'll finish on time. Are you able to hear me at the back? No problem? Okay, good. God bless you. The topic for today is the cost of discipleship. To be a disciple is to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a choice that we make. At the point of time we accept Christ into our hearts as Savior and Lord, we become the children of God, we become the recipients of this gift of salvation. But that point of time is actually an end of a search for people like me from different faith. End of a search, but the beginning of a new life. In this new life, it's up to us to choose to follow Him or follow our own will. Salvation is a gift given to us. God won't take it back. Because Romans 11.29 says, His gifts and His call are irrevocable. He will not take back. The call He has in my life will remain. Gifts will remain, including salvation. He won't take back. But then in response to his gift of salvation, what do we do? Do we choose to follow him or do we choose to follow our own way of life? It's a choice. God will never force his will. That's the nature of God. He will reveal his will. He won't force his will. If he were to force his will, we'll all be like Jesus, sinless. He won't force. He will reveal His will. It is up to us to find out His will and do His will. In Ephesians 5.17, Paul writes, Do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Now supposing it is not possible for you and me to know the will of God, and therefore we don't find out, we are not foolish. If it is not possible, and therefore we don't try to find out we are not foolish because we can't find out when we can know the will of God and choose not to follow it or find out then we are foolish every one of us can know the will of God because we are his children every child knows the voice of the parent so all of us can know the will of God now when we choose to do the will of God we will face difficulties in life there's a cost of being a disciple. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, Paul writes, If anyone chooses to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, he will be persecuted. Now the word persecution is too big a word for me in my life. I don't think I'm persecuted. None of us is persecuted. We think we are persecuted, we are not persecuted. When I went to Russia and ministered there in 1991, the congregation, about 100 people, 75% did not have arms or legs, were cut off by the communists during the persecution time. No arm, no leg. But they are all so joyful, so happy. In two months time, I became so close to them, they used to call me Brad Raj. Brad means brother, Raj is my name. At the end of this uh, time there, when they sent me back to India, when I came back to India, the whole church joined together and prayed for me. Our Brad Raj is going to India. Let us send him to India as a missionary. <laughs> to win all Indians for Christ. For as far as they are concerned, I am their missionary to India. So much of love. When you go through persecution, no? You have a lot of love. I found that in them. We don't face all those persecutions, right? One day electricity goes, we think we are persecuted. No water in the tap. Why, Lord? Why you do this to me, Lord? As God only stopped the water. So the small, small things we get upset. None of us at the end been persecuted. But then we choose to live a godly life. We will face difficulties in life. And therefore you should know how to handle difficulties. The Lord Jesus Christ once told a, a passage very difficult for some people to understand. 10th chapter of Matthew from verse 34. He says, I have not come to bring peace. I come with a sword. 
not to bring peace. I come with the sword. I come to turn a son against the father, daughter against the mother, daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. A man's enemies with members of his own household. He who loves the son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves the father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who does not take his cross daily and follow me is not worthy of me. Now the God who is the Prince of Peace, who came to establish peace between man and God, he says, I have not come to bring peace, I come with the sword. The sword is not to harm, sword is to divide. The word peace means oneness, oneness. In a Jewish family, a lot of oneness, they are all very uh, close to each other, very close in families. When one of them became a believer in Jesus, they were cut off by the family. Cut off. No more unity. Earlier, family very close, very close to each other, loving each other. And one person believed that this Jesus is the Christ, they put away. And not only that, they put away from the synagogue also. In fact, uh, if you look at John 16, chapter verse 2, that they put away from the synagogue. Synagogue is a place of uh, actually uh, social interaction also. Apart from place of teaching, there is social interaction. Like we have today community centers. Every colony in Delhi has a community center where they have functions, festivals, uh, engagements, sometimes weddings also. Synagogue is not only a place of teaching but for people to meet together. Social gatherings were held in synagogues. And we put out a synagogue no place in society. That's why the blind man's parents, when they were asked by the uh, Jews, was this their son? Was he blind? How come he's able to see? The parents said, you ask him, he's of age. You know why they said that? They were scared that he put out a synagogue. If they say he's our son, and Jesus healed him, that they believe in Jesus, they put a synagogue. John 9, 22. And therefore, they were cut off. So for them, they had to, uh, when they believe that Jesus is the Christ, problem in the family. This sword divides. Peace means oneness. No peace when you believe in Jesus. But the beautiful thing is, when you uh, take a stand to live for Jesus, after some time, God will make even enemies live at peace with us. In Psalm 16, 7 it says, when a man's ways are pleasing to God, he makes even his enemies live at peace with him. He will test us to see, do we love him more than our own dear, near, near, near and dear ones. There's one verse, very uh, word, word spoken by Jesus, which I don't think any wife will put on the wall of the house. You know, in most uh, homes, Christian homes, we find on the wall various Bible verses, standard verses. I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. My grace is sufficient for you. My God supply all your needs. Standard verses we find on the walls. Cast your anxiety upon him for he cares for you. But this one verse, I doubt whether anybody put on the wall of the house. This is a verse in found in Luke 14, 26. Where Jesus says, If anyone comes after me and does not hit his father and mother, brothers and sisters, wife and children, in his own life, he cannot be my disciple. What an awesome statement. If anyone comes after me, wants to be my disciple, does not hate his father and mother, brothers and sisters, wife and children, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. The same Lord who says, love your enemies, here he is saying, unless you hate your near and dear ones, you can't be my disciple. What does it mean? It means, our love for God must be so intense, so profound, so strong, that the love for our near and dear ones, in comparison, is like hate. That's a calling God has for all of us. Which wife will put a wall of the house, bedroom wall? Morning, husband gets up, looks at the wall, unless I hate my wife, I can't be my disciple of Jesus. Nobody put that on the wall. But look at the spirit behind that. Spirit behind that is we put God number one. You know, when I was in, uh, working for my company, 
and I used to do ministry also. People who asked me, they used to ask me, Brother, we know God is number one for you. What is two, three, four? Family, ministry, work, ministry, family, work, a work, family, ministry, what is number two, three, four? Number one is God. What is your priority? And I told them, for me, number one is God, number two is God, number three is God, number four is God. God of my life, number one. God of my family, number one. God of my work, number one. God of my ministry, number one. Everything. God of my work, number one. So every day you have to live for Jesus. And there's no confusion at all. No confusion. I, I remember once I and my wife had gone to Zimbabwe for ministry. Uh, the theological college of Zimbabwe. I was speaking for the uh, theological students and their staff. And they heard about my travel here and all over the world. They asked me, Brother, how come uh, you travel so many places and your wife is left alone at home? How does she manage when you are away? And then that, that's then my wife is coming through the hall. He had gone out, she's coming inside. I told her, they asking a question. I was about to answer, they said, No, no, we want from your, aunt, your wife to answer. And she came forward. Boldly she came forward. Normally she's a very shy person. They asked her, Madam, how do you manage when a husband travels so much? And she's a very innocent person, very childlike. And then she told them, You see, when Raj is at home, the house is very hectic. People come, people go, very busy. Very hectic it is when he's at home. When he leaves the home, there's peace in the home. <laughs> So they are involved of families in ministry, don't, don't uh, work alone. So she was very understanding and praise God, God gave her out of turn promotion to go to heaven. I'm still waiting to go. But there's a cost to uh, following Jesus. And uh, we'll miss out on so many things, we'll lose friends, we'll lose family members sometimes. In my case, both my parents got very angry with me when I became a believer. Both my parents, my father was 70 years old, my, my, wife, my, my mother was 64 years old. They were very angry with me. I was in Germany. I prayed for them. I said, Lord, uh, they love me very much. I'm the youngest son. They want the best for me. When they know I have your peace and your joy, and I share the gospel, I know, Lord, they will turn to you. I'll commit them both into your hands. I came back to India. They came and stayed in our house only. And sure enough, after four years, my dad gave his life to Christ. But a few more years, my mother also gave her life to Christ. Both died as believers in Christ. And it's very interesting, the day he, he died, uh, two days before actually I had uh, I spoken to him, and I, I told him that uh, he gave his life to Christ two days before he died, two days before. That's when he gave his life. In the hospital, I shared the gospel with him. He knew the gospel, but then last minute I shared, and two days later he was gone. And when he passed away, they opened the will. They opened the will. Uh, here he left instructions with this uh, executive of the will. When I die, I want my will to be opened the moment, on the very first day after I die. Don't wait for, wait for 10 days. Normally they take 10 days to open the will. There is a ceremony, 10 day, 13 day ceremony. He said open it as soon as I die. And he opened the will. The first sentence, in fact what happened then was, when my brothers came to know my father passed away, they called me from USA. They both settled in USA. We can't come in time for the funeral and you do the rituals. Rituals you do. Normally elder son does. I'm the youngest son. My brother said, no, no, I can't come in time. I'll come for the immersion of the ashes. You do the rituals. How can I do rituals? I said, Lord, I can't do the rituals. You handle it. Four o'clock in the morning, my father passed away. Six o'clock, telephone came from USA, from Boston. I kept quiet, I put the phone down. God, Lord, I can't do this. I will obey you. My heavenly father, not the earthly father. His will. And my brothers and sisters all said, they all thought I'll do rituals. Two hours later, my dad's friend came home and he said, open the will. Because he told me he must open the will. The first sentence in the will was, at my death, I do not want any ritual. I don't believe in these rituals. There's no ritual. 
God is a gracious God. But of course, we go through difficulties. And the beautiful thing is, when we go through difficulties, people don't like us when we become believers. Our own friends desert us. They'll persecute us, they'll scoff us, mock us. But we get used to it. Simple formula, how to handle rejection. Get used to it. 1 Peter, 2nd chapter 4 and 5. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him. You also like living stones are being built in a spiritual house. So don't be surprised if the world hates you. That's part of discipleship. When you follow the Lord, people don't understand. Because Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 says, God's ways and man's ways are different. God's thoughts and man's thoughts are different. We are now strangers in the world. Earlier we were familiar with the world, now we, now we become strangers. Normally when you go to a new country, like when I went to Germany in 1979, I was a stranger initially. I learned the language, I learned the culture in, in three months time. Then I was working in German language, I became familiar with the culture, with the way of life in Germany. Three years I was there, very familiar. So becoming familiar after being a stranger is a learning process. Christian life is the opposite. We were familiar with the world, when we turn to Christ, we become strangers. The reverse process. Just like we become familiar after being a stranger by learning, we become strangers after being familiar by unlearning. Unlearning. Our minds have to undergo a renewal, typical brain washing, literally brain has to be washed, it is full of garbage, our thinking process. Now we are changed, he changes us, we follow him and when we follow him we will have many difficulties. But one thing, he may have difficulties but we will have the peace of God and the joy of the Lord. In John 16, 33, Jesus says, John 16, 33, I have told you these things that in me you will have peace. Peace means oneness. In the world you will have troubles, but take heart, I have overcome the world. The Lord never promised a life free of troubles. He never said, you follow me, everything will be fine. A hunky dory, no problem for you, everything fine. No, there are problems. He says, in me, you'll have peace. In the world, you'll have troubles, tribulation. You shouldn't be surprised when you have difficulties. Then in John 15, 11, I give got three verses, John 15, 9, 10, 11. The Lord says, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Remain in my love. If you obey my Father's commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you this, that my joy may be in you, and your joy will be complete. My joy, he spoke about. My peace, he spoke about in John 14, 27. John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I have given to you. So as we obey the Lord, as we are truly disciples of Jesus, we will have the same peace he had, the same joy he had. And nobody can take away that peace and joy. It only depends upon our walk with God. Now having spoken about difficulties when you follow the Lord, let me talk about how we can be people who understand the blessings of difficulties. Blessings of trials. The book of James, chapter 1, verse 12, it says, James 1, 12, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. When he stood the test, he will receive the crown of glory which will never fade away. The crown of, the crown of life which God has promised those who love him. When he perseveres under trial, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. So when we understand the blessings of 
difficulties of trials in the will of God. I'm going to speak about 10 blessings today. I'll just touch upon them. I won't elaborate. There's no time for that. But note on all the 10 blessings. Once you go through all the 10 blessings, you'll realize, you'll realize you have 10 reasons never to complain to God when you go through trials. When you have some difficulty or trial, the first thing you must ask God is, am I going through trials because of something wrong I have done or because of my obedience to you? First ask that, because sometimes we face consequences of our actions. So God Holy Spirit will guide us, counsel us as to why we are facing trials. If it's because of something wrong we have done, repent, put it behind. And once we judge ourselves, we will not come under judgment. 1 Corinthians 11.31 You say, Lord, I have sinned. Enough for God. He will forgive us and He will purify us from all unrighteousness. If something, nothing wrong we have done and yet face difficulties, then we rejoice. Rejoice because God has found us worthy of suffering for His name. Let me enumerate all the ten points. The first one is taken from the life of Job. When Job went through all those difficulties, at one point of time, he says, 19th chapter of Job, 25-26, I know that my Redeemer lives, and then he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, in my flesh I will see God. That's the cry of Job. In the New Testament, when James writes, James chapter 5, 10, 11, he writes, Brothers, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we consider blessed those who are persevered. You heard of Job's perseverance. You've seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. He was a blessed person, Job. And people wonder, look at his life. In one day he lost everything. 7,000 sheep, 2,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 donkeys, 7 sons, 3 daughters, all one day gone. What does he do? He falls down and worships God. Worships God. Job chapter 1 verse 20. He fell down and worshipped God. Now he was a blessed person. When you ask uh, any Christian, what did God finally bring about in Job's life? Most will say, God doubled his possessions. 7,000 became 14,000, 2,000 became 6,000, 500 became 1,000, and he again got 73 daughters. This time they are more beautiful than the first time. That's what people say. What God really brought about was something different. He cries out, I know my Redeemer lives. And then he will stand upon the earth. After my skin has been destroyed, in my flesh I will see God. And after God spoke to him, asked him many questions, and not one question he could answer. In 42nd chapter of Job, verse 5, Job says, My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. What God brought about finally was a revelation of himself. The greatest blessing of trials is we know God that much more. Through trials, we understand the nature of God even more. Nothing greater than knowing God more and more. Trials draw us close to him, close to him. So number one was that. Number two, from the, from the letter of Peter, we understand. In 1 Peter chapter 1, 6 and 7, Peter writes about how while living in this world, we have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Trials come to refine our faith. As we hear the word of God, faith increases. Faith comes from hearing the word. 
Romans 10, 17. As the word comes to us, we put it to practice. As true disciples, we follow him. Then what happens? Difficulties come. Why have they come? To refine our faith. Gold refined through fire perishes also. Whereas our faith is refined through difficulties. Second blessing of trials is, through trials, our faith gets even more stronger and sure. Number three, all this applied in my own life. So it is 42 years now as a Christian, God never allowed me ever to get discouraged. Discouraging thoughts come, but I rebuke them in Jesus' name because they are not from God. Something not from God, throw it away. The third blessing is that we give God the privilege of showing us off to Satan. Remember the time when God spoke about Job to Satan? Job chapter 1 verse 8. Have you considered my servant Job? There's no one like him in all the earth. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. And Satan says, oh, you put a hedge around him. He's your favorite, your blue-eyed boy. That's why he's faithful to you. And the Lord allows Satan to touch Job's possessions. And Job attacks, I'm sorry, uh, Satan attacks Job, his possessions, his body also full of boils. Yet Job maintains his integrity. He praises and worships God. Again, God spoke about Job to Satan. Second chapter, verse 3. Have you considered my servant Job? There's no one on earth like him. He's blameless and upright, man who fears God and shuns evil. He still maintains integrity, even though you insulted me to harm him without any reason. God is so happy with Job. He showed off Job to Satan. When we go through trials and don't complain, don't argue, don't blame God, then instead of that, we praise God and worship Him. God will be so pleased, He will show us off even to Satan. As a new believer, when a wife fell sick, when they accepted Christ, she lost her mind. The Lord gave me a promise about how he's going to heal her. The devil came and spoke to me. When you did not believe in Jesus, everything was fine in your life. Everything was fine. Now she's become a mental patient. Forget about this Jesus. Go back. By the grace of God, before the devil spoke to me, God had given me a verse in the Bible about Job. Job 1.8 I know God won't tell about me there's no one like Rajkumar that he will not say but when I praise him and worship him in difficulties he's so happy he can't help showing me off to Satan so I told evil one don't come and talk to me I will worship God I will praise him for who he is for who I am my name is Rajkumar Rajkumar means what prince and prince because the father is king of kings and lord of lords. They won't change. Always, always be a Rajkumar. All of you are Rajkumars and Rajkumaris. Do you know that? They are all princesses and princesses. Your father is a king. Told the devil, don't come and talk to me. Now they are talking to me. You go and listen to what my lord is telling about me. I will worship him. I will praise him. Go and listen to him. He won't say there's no one like Rajkumar. That he won't say. There are many. But then he's so happy, he'll show me off to you. Go, go and listen to him. Go and talk to me. I learned a simple formula how to handle the devil. When he talks to you about your past, you talk to him about his future. Talk about his future. The past is gone, he won't come. Future is ahead of us. Remind him where you are going, heaven, and where he's going, hell. He won't like it, he'll run away. You resist him, he'll run away from you. Try it next time. Some people ask me some questions like, brother, why does God want us to praise him? Some people ask this question. Why should God be so egoistic? 
He wants us to praise Him. Why should I praise Him? I have so many problems in life. He wants my praises. He is an egoistic God. I heard people say that. I tell him, look here, when you praise God, we are blessed. He's still on his throne. When we praise the Lord at all times, the devil doesn't like it. He'll run away. To resist the devil, he's free from you. How to resist God? How to resist the devil? Worship God. Draw close to God. God always wants to do things for our benefit, for our good. He is a selfless God. So by praising Him and worshipping Him, we are helping ourselves. By resisting the devil, He'll run away from you. He'll run away from you. He won't come near you. So worship Him at all times. A very simple verse in the Bible, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 3 verses, 16, 17, 18. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. In all circumstances, give thanks to God. The third reason is that we're giving God the privilege of showing us off even to Satan. When I say this to people, Christian, they say, just because God wants to boast about me to Satan, why should I suffer here? He's in heaven, enjoying heaven. I am on earth, suffering here. He has to boast about me, so I should go to trials. So come to the fourth point. The fourth point is, it's fascinating. Every trouble we go through here in this world for our obedience to the Lord is creating for us glory in heaven. Second Corinthians, fourth chapter, 16, 17, 18. Second Corinthians, fourth chapter, 16, 17, 18. Though outwardly we are wasting away, inward will be renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are creating for us eternal glory in heaven. Troubles are creating glory in heaven. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. What is seen is temporary, what is unseen is eternal. How do we fix our eyes on things unseen? They are unseen, they are unseen. How can we fix our eyes on it? Simple answer. 1 Corinthians, 2nd chapter, 9 and 10. 1 Corinthians, chapter 2, 9 and 10. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love Him. But He revealed to us through His Spirit. When you have fellowship with the Holy Spirit, when you go through trials, He will remind you that these trials are creating for you eternal glory in heaven. The Lord is preparing mansions for us in heaven. Mansions. More troubles here, bigger mansions. More bedrooms. No trouble here, construction stopped in heaven. They go on strike. Angels go on strike. I won't build for them. He's not suffering. I'm not going to build. I'm just giving a, like, in a lighter vein. But it's so true. Troubles create glory in heaven. And therefore, don't complain no troubles. Every trouble we go through is creating glory in heaven. In Romans chapter 8, 17, 18, Paul writes, If your children, they are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his suffering, not that we share in his glory. If indeed we share in his suffering, so that we share in his glory. Next verse he says, I consider our present suffering in this world is nothing compared to the glory revealed in us. The ratio of glory to suffering is so high, it's not worth comparing. The suffering is nothing compared to glory in heaven. So fix our eyes on what is unseen, which means have fellowship with the Holy Spirit. At the fourth point, let me drink some water, excuse me. The fifth point is that through difficulties, three of the nine aspects of the fruit of the Spirit are worked out in our lives. Three out of nine. Fruit of the Spirit. What is fruit of the Spirit? Galatians chapter 5, 20 23. It's not fruits of the Spirit. It's not fruits, it's fruit. 
one fruit with nine qualities sometimes people say no christian they say come to my church brother very lovely church all the fruits are there he's got joy he's got love he's got peace a pastor has got patience all pastors are patience they don't have it the congregation congregation will teach the pastor patience he's got self control he's got uh, faithfulness all nine all nine are there in a church actually every christian should have all nine one fruit with nine qualities not nine fruits so the question is the kind of fruit we bear depends on the seed apple seed can't bear orange fruit orange seed can't bear apple fruit we born of the seed of god holy spirit so naturally we'll bear fruit of the spirit for which we must live by the spirit the nine qualities are love joy peace patience kindness goodness faithfulness gentleness and self control out of nine three of them self control patience and faith are worked out by god in us through difficult people and difficult circumstances you don't need self control and everyone is very sweet to you everyone is so nice and goody goody saying nice thing you need self control don't need patience because i was in industry people come to me they have questions so whether you were in industry you know how difficult it is to work to be a christian in the industry the corporate world is so difficult i have one guy in my office who always troubles me keep on troubling me i can't manage that whether please pray and transfer from the department i can't work with it very difficult please pray now i can't say no to pray i pray two months i pray then he comes to me are you praying brother yes i am praying no transfer he still that change your prayer if god can't transfer him let him transfer, transfer me i can't work so two more months this prayer goes transfer me from my department not answer comes again this happened many years back very often actually happened but this guy i remember very clearly he told me this then he again come back to four months brother i am not transferred he is not transferred very difficult to work with him okay please pray i have more patience to handle it i want more patience to handle it this prayer is answered how one difficult person he had two more like him into the department basic training over advanced training now because when you ask god for patience you ask him for trouble do you know that and every repeat that when you ask god for patience ask him for trouble why troubles work with patience romans 5:2 you don't know what you're asking sometimes simply we ask you don't know how we god answers i want more faith troubles will come more patience troubles will come i want more love to love this person lord he will become more difficult to love but praise god he will answer our prayer by giving us strength giving us the resources so difficult people and difficult circumstances are important for us i do a lot of meetings for pastors i've been doing for many years pastors conferences and i always recommend pastors please visit your congregation members especially those who are against you those are against you go and visit them they like to visit the favorite families who say goody goody things to them visit people who are angry with you upset with you you will get trained because the difficulty is very important for us otherwise we be you know we won't develop in patience so to bear the fruit of spirit god allows difficult people difficult circumstances to train us in faith patience and self control that is number what is number 4 is 5 number 5 right number 6 is actually training for counseling second corinthians chapter 1 3 4 or 5 pray be the god and father of lord jesus christ the father of compassion and the god of all comfort who comforts us in all our troubles let me comfort others in your trouble 
with the comfort received from God. For just as sufferings of Christ flow into our lives, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. Suffering flows, comfort overflows. Where the God of all comfort comforts us in all our troubles. Any trouble we go through, He comforts us. Have you ever wondered about this particular verse in the Bible? The Beatitudes. Matthew chapter 5, verse 4. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. The word blessed there is makarios in Greek. Makarios means what? Happy. Happy. So he replaced uh, blessed with uh, happy. Happy are those who mourn. How can you be happy when you mourn? When you mourn, can you be happy? Why are we happy? In that mourning, he comforts us. Therefore, we are happy. While going through the mourning period, he comforts us. We rise above the situation and we are happy in the Lord. This God of all comfort comforts in all our troubles. The word comfort is a, in, Greek, in Greek is paraklesis. It means encouragement. Paraklesis is encouragement. Parakalio is encouraging. Parakletos is Holy Spirit, Counselor. When the Counselor counsels us, Parakalio, we are comforted, we are encouraged. That is Paraklesis. And the God of all comfort comforts in all our troubles. So what happens then is, when you go through a trial and God comforts you, you have been trained for the future ministry of encouraging people who have the same problem. My wife had lived for 15 years. Pyle knows Ragni very well, very close to my wife she was. She is, my wife is no more. And uh, she, she was a very quiet person, but she has a special burden for people who are depressed. Normally when people come home, I talk. She just listen quietly. With close people she will talk. But when someone comes in with a mental issue, depression, problems, she pays the burden because she came out of it. It's a tremendous burden for people who are depressed, mentally upset, simply because she went through it. So when you go through a trouble and come out of it, you are better in a better position to go and help somebody else who goes through it. It's like, you know, imagine a man who has an alcohol problem, alcohol, can't get over alcohol. If a pastor or a church leader who has never drunk in his life at all, tells him, drinking is bad. He will say, I know better than you. You've got theoretical knowledge, I've got practical experience. You've got theoretical knowledge. You've never drunk in your life, no? You know it's wrong. I know it's wrong also. But I've got practical experience of how bad it is. They want solutions. I'm not, I'm not saying you should drink and then go and counsel. <laughs> But you come out of a habit, you have better position to go and tell the person. I was also once like you, I, God healed me, now you can be healed. Then you feel more comfortable. Oh, you also used to drink. Actually, I also used to drink, but I stopped from drinking. When a better position, go and counsel. God allows us to go through difficulties to prepare us for the ministry of the future. So don't look at any trouble as, why me, Lord? Why I'm going through this? Later on, you'll find someone, 20 years later, I had a similar problem. I was in a better position to go and tell the person, I was like you, but my Lord healed me. The same Lord, yesterday, today, and forever. Praise God. That's number six. Number seven is again, uh, to keep us humble, God allows difficulties. To keep us humble. In 2 Corinthians 12 chapter, the Apostle Paul wrote about the thorn in the flesh. But come his way, torn in the flesh. And he said, Lord, take it away. What is the torn in the flesh? Always important for us to use the scripture to explain scripture. Scripture explains scripture. One part of the Bible is the other part of the Bible. The torn in the flesh actually is the messenger of Satan. Torn in the flesh, comma, messenger of Satan. A messenger means someone who brings a message. He's a messenger. Messenger of Satan means 
someone sent by Satan to Paul with a message. What kind of message will be? What kind of message? Can't be encouraging, can't be building up, only insulting and discouraging. So, so somebody troubling Paul. In the Old Testament time, we read about how difficult people, unwanted people were referred to as thistles, barbs and thorns. Book of Numbers, 3355, number 3355, Joshua 2313, Judges chapter 2 verse 3, Joshua 2313, Numbers 3355, and Judges 2 3. Difficult people. God tells his, his people, don't intermarry with the people living in the land of Canaan. They'll become thistles, barbs, and thorns in your sights. So difficult people, the Old Testament referred to as thistles, barbs, and thorns. First century, thorn in the flesh. 21st century, pain in the neck. They come and trouble us, irritate us, insult us, pull us down. They're important for us. You know why? To keep us humble. To keep us humble. When Paul asked the Lord to take away the thorn in the flesh, the Lord told him, My grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Why did God allow the thorn in the flesh to come his way? Paul understood that later on. Second Corinthians 12 chapter verse 7 on this. To keep me from becoming conceited because of this great revelation that give me a thorn in the flesh. Because of the revelation he got, God saw in Paul the tendency to become proud. He's not a proud man. He was a humble man. But God saw in his heart, God always sees the heart only, primarily. He saw in Paul's heart the tendency to become proud because of the great revelation. So God gave him a vitamin C to prevent him getting proud. When you're he, sneezing, no, in a change of weather, you sneeze. When you sneeze, you take vitamin C to prevent a cold. Once a cold comes, vitamin C won't help in antibiotics. But vitamin C is good for preventing. So for preventing us from becoming proud, God gives vitamin C's, many vitamin C's. Difficult people come and insult us, irritate us. And Paul understood that. He says, therefore, I delight in insults, in weaknesses, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. When I'm weak, I'm strong. So difficult people are important for us because when everyone praises you, you get so used to praises, you can't handle criticism. When everyone curses you, one more person curses you, no problem. Everybody curses me, one more fellow, so what? I got used to it. Problem is when everyone praises you, you put it in a pedestal. Then you be very careful. Then one person criticizing you, take it, take it, I don't want it. Lord, I don't want this. Everyone praising me, now one person troubling you, that was very important for you to keep us humble. All of us have a share of such people. Every church has a share of quota of these fellows. Men and women, who trouble. Always finding fault. They come in the morning to church, the pew is not a uh, little dusty. It happens in some church. Pastor, pastor, come look at the pew. It's got dust in it. Poor pastor takes out an anchor and wipes it. Why can't you wipe it? Your church. You are a pastor of one church. Huh? Some father try to find out. But the people are important for us to keep us humble. Very important. So, to keep us from becoming proud, God allows difficult people, difficult circumstances. That is number seven. Three more I got, I quickly go through. Number eight is the fact that we are the workmanship of God. Workmanship of God. He works on us to show us off to the world. And he wants to show to the world the peace beyond understanding. The peace we have is a peace beyond understanding. Now, when people see the peace in us, they may come and ask us, I've got, uh, you've got a lot of peace. Uh, how is that you got so much of peace? You don't have any problems, have you? Don't have any problems? 
You say, I have no problem. Oh, that's why you got peace. You have no problem, so you got peace. I understand, I understand. But suppose we have difficulties and still have peace. They can't understand. So when they come to you, looking at your peace, they'll ask you, any problems? You say, yeah, I got this problem, I got this problem, I got this problem. Oh, so many problems? How come you got peace? I can't understand how you got peace. That's why it's a peace beyond understanding. How can God demonstrate that peace to the world unless we have problems? So we have problems. Thank God for problems. Thank Him for making a display of His splendor. Ephesians 2.10. In fact, uh, that's the workmanship of God. In Ephesians 2.10, it says we are the workmanship of God. In Isaiah 49.3, God tells His people, Israelites, You are my servant Israel, in whom I will display my splendor. And you are display my splendor. So we are all displays of God's splendor, wherever we go. He will reveal to them, through our lives, the peace beyond understanding. That they can't understand because we have so much of suffering and troubles, yet we have peace. So we are display of God's splendor. Never forget that. Don't let the, the, your suffering overflow, let comfort overflow. With many Christians, when they go through difficulties, they suffer, they make everybody else around them also suffer. Whereas our suffering should not overflow, comfort must overflow. So eighth one was display of God's splendor, especially the peace beyond understanding. Number nine is manifesting the love of God. When you go through trials, and keep on praising God, worshipping Him, rejoicing in Him, then what happens is, He manifests the love of God by default. Romans chapter 5, 2 to 5. We rejoice the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, we rejoice in our suffering. The suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, character hope, and hope does not disappoint us because God's love is poured out to us to the Holy Spirit whom He has given us. So as we look out to the Lord and worship and praise Him in difficulties, He showers love into our hearts to love other people. Love is a natural byproduct of going through suffering and rejoicing in suffering. This I saw very evidently in the church in Siberia, underground church. The first time I went to underground church was a miraculous way. I led a person to Christ in the office. He was a working, uh, he was doing the electronics in the underground church. He said, you come there. You come there, they, they know, they'll be happy to see you. First time I walked into the church, they didn't ask me which denomination I belonged to, which denomination. They said, uh, God, Raj, come and speak. He said, I've come only to uh, be part of the church. No, you speak today. I asked them, uh, how long should I speak? I'm a Methodist, no, very methodical. How long should I speak? Pastor said, God tell you when to stop. <laughs> Total depends on God. They only know my name, which church I come from, what's my background, nothing, won't speak. That's the beginning of my ministry, fantastic ministry thereafter. God's anointing was tremendous in all the, all the services. Every Sunday I used to make me speak, different churches. And so much of love for other churches. This pastor told me, Today you spoke in our church, next week go to some other church, I'll arrange for you. Let them also benefit from your ministry. And one day what happened, they called a lot of old uh, army people, Second World War veterans for a meeting, all atheists. And they said, uh, uh, Raj is coming for the meeting, Raj is going to speak. They don't know who Raj is. Those days they knew only two Indians. One is Indira Gandhi, other is Raj Kapoor. So all the elderly people came. One general came with medals, all the, three rows of medals to impress Raj Kapoor. He came there, he found this Kronji fellow, Gabbar Raj Kapoor, I'm such a Kronji fellow. It is a Raj. Praise God, all those people came that day, gave their lives to Christ. Including general, he knelt down and accepted Christ. Praise God. But the, the church is so full of love. Selfless love. That's number nine. Love is manifestation of going through trials, joyfully. Number 10, last one, is growing into maturity. Maturity. 
Uh, James chapter 1, 2, 3, 4. James 1, 2, 3, 4, James writes, Consider pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. For the testing of her faith, there is perseverance. Perseverance finishes the work in you, that you be mature and complete, not lacking anything. We all know that we've been given fullness in Christ. Abundant life we've been given. It doesn't happen overnight. Don't think it happens overnight. It's a process. We have to go through trials. We have to go through long suffering. What's long suffering? Suffering long. Not short, suffering long. When going through trials, rejoice. Keep on praising God. We are on our way to become mature. The word mature is complete, both the Greek word is teleon. Teleon, T-E-L-E-I-O-N. Teleon means complete, mature, full, fullness. So when you go through difficulties joyfully, you are on our way to become mature and complete, not lacking anything. Abundant life. Abundant life is not having money. Money is not abundant life. The Lord said in Luke 12, 15, Luke 12, 15, a man's love does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Possessions are nothing. They are mine, it will go off. You know, the Old Testament verse says, Proverbs 23, chapter verse 5, Proverbs 23, 5, cast a glance on the riches, it is gone. Cast a glance on the riches, it is gone. You go to Bombay Stock Exchange, you look at the indices, your share value is flashing on the screen. Oh, my value has gone very high. Soaring. I'm a sell man. Shares now. Take a cup of coffee, one sip. Put it down. Look up. Gone. Cast a glance. It's gone. Don't waste your time. I'm not saying, I'm, I'm not against stock market. You know, I don't know stock market. But I know about it. <laughs> don't put a trust in all these things. Put a trust in the Lord. So ten blessings. Ten reasons never to grumble or question God. And when you live for Him, one thing will not go away from you is the peace of God, the joy of the Lord. Philippians chapter 2, I'll close with this. Philippians chapter 2 from verse 14 to 16. Do everything without complaining or arguing. You may complain this and pure. Children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation. As you shine like stars in the universe, as you hold on, hold out the word of life. No complaining, no arguing, no questioning, no grumbling. See, grumbling was a terrible thing before God. When they came from Egypt, when they grumbled along the way, God sent snakes to bite them and they died. For grumbling, snakes came. More grumbling, more snakes. Thank God today that doesn't happen. Otherwise, Sunday morning, in the church you'll find live snakes and dead bodies. Today, God is a gracious God. That's why you're not punished. So don't grumble, don't question, don't argue with God against anybody. Some people tell me, whether I don't grumble against God. I only grumble against people. Especially my wife I grumble against. He confesses to me. I tell them, James 5, 9 says, don't grumble against one another. That also God. No grumbling against God, no grumbling against people. What do I do then, brother? Praise God, worship God, thank Him. Nothing left. They can't grumble against God, can't grumble people, nothing left for them to talk. Praise God, worship Him in all circumstances. You will rise above difficulties. Amen. God bless you. My one hour is over. And we have time for questions later on. We can have discussions now. And this is a very practical thing. You all know. We all face difficulties. Nobody can say I have no difficulties in life. We have no difficulty which He cannot solve. We have difficulties. No difficulty we have which He cannot solve. So give it to Him and enjoy Christian life. God bless you. Amen.